Well, I'd like to talk about some of the coaches over the years, and I'll get your thoughts on Pat Quinn, perhaps both of you in a moment, but what about uh, back to the days of Roger Nielsen when he took over? Well, Roger, as uh, these fellows know too, uh, was a very interesting guy. He had a lot of new ideas, and he was such a mild-mannered guy, never, uh, no cuss words, no, I'm sure he was, uh, to the players, too, was such a gentleman. Fan support that we have had here this year in the playoffs is probably uh, unparalleled in NHL history. I think he worked for 10 NHL teams. He'd be out of a job for a week or two, and then somebody else would hire him. I remember when he got fired by the Canucks. We were in Edmonton and got smacked pretty good. And the next morning, I go down for breakfast, and here's Roger sitting there with his head down. And I said, Roger, what's the matter? He said, I'm going to get fired today. I said, Roger, you're not going to get fired, you know. He gave me a scoop, and I didn't know it. <laughs> it was a quarter to eight in the morning, I guess. I could have on the 810 sports in the morning on the radio and had the story. But I thought, no, you're not going to get fired. At 10 a.m., he was fired. He was such a fair guy all the time, and coaches aren't always that way. And he treated people the way he wanted to be treated. He had great ideas. But it is true, one of the criticisms of Roger was that he didn't, necessarily communicate and handle star players as well as he handled the foot soldier kind of guys because they all loved him because he played them. But he didn't necessarily treat the superstars the way they often wanted to be treated in terms of the ice time he gave them and sometimes they pushed back at him and it cost him a couple of jobs. Did Pat Quinn know how to do that? Boy, did he ever know how to communicate with his players. Uh, he, he ran long practices. He had the greatest, from what I understand, the greatest pregame speeches because everybody would come out of the dressing room or we'd, you'd talk to players after and they'd say, you should have heard Pat tonight, <laughs> what he said before the game. I just skated right through the boards for him. But he was a real communicator to his players and uh, just beloved. I never heard a bad word from players about Pat Quinn, certainly not the guys who stayed around and played with him for a long time. When you tie in with someone uh, to accomplish something, you have to be loyal. The only way to do that is uh, to be upfront and straightforward. And th if that's loyalty, then that's the way I feel it needs to happen. I think one of the great fun stories was he was coaching the Toronto Maple Leafs when Gary Volk, ex-Canuck, was playing for the Leafs. And he'd been dropped from the second line on down. He was playing the fourth line, I guess. And he went to Pat and said, why am I on the fourth line? And Pat said, because we don't have a fifth line. <laughs> The late 90s are a bit of a tumultuous time, but then into the early 2000s and the hiring of Mark Crawford, do uh, you remember that time? It's not an awful lot different than what's going on right now. If you remember when this building, uh, Rogers Arena, first opened, there were some nights after about a year when it was cavernously quiet in here, and it was a team truly in transition because they'd gone to the Stanley Cup final in 94, were ousted in four straight games in 95 by Chicago, and it was clearly time for a change. Now, the transition was a whole bunch of different people behind the bench and on the ice, but if you think about the players that actually took the next step for the team into the 2000s, they were players that had been high picks in other organizations, but had been cast off or traded away. Here's Naz on the right wing, 42 to go on the power play. Back to Sopel, shot deflected, he scores! Bertuzzi, his 30th of the year! Todd Bertuzzi, nobody was sure if he was going to make it with the Islanders. Marcus Naslin was a quivering wreck when he first got here and was a healthy scratch and became one of the greatest players in franchise history. Brendan Morrison uh, came for Al McGilney uh, from New Jersey. But nobody really knew how this group was going to come together. And they didn't come together right away, but they stayed with it and through... Uh, Mike Keenan and then subsequently Brian Burke, they put a group together that by the 2000s and in the early part of the 2000s to 2005 and into the first big lockout, they were the best team in the National Hockey League. They were rock stars. What I remember about Vino was, well, first of all, the daily gut-busting belly laughs we would have. <laughs> and Elaine Vino is cracking up again. He can't control himself. <laughs> what I remember is, is the way he realized he had a good team a veteran team, and at a certain point, in fact, I remember the point, it was a game in Ottawa, and they had a really lackluster start to the game, and it came to the intermission, and his gut instinct as a coach was to go in and just rip the team. And I think it was Rick Bonus told him, nope, we have a good veteran group here. Let's not even go in the room. We'll let them figure it out. And uh, lo and behold, they did. And uh, that was sort of the, the moment that he turned the dressing room over to the players knowing that um, he had a really good veteran leadership group. 